Please, Mr. Lyon, Aslan, sir, said Diggory, could you, well, may I please, please will you give me some magic fruit of this country to make my mother well? He had been desperately hoping that the lion would say yes. He'd been horribly afraid it might say no, but he was taken aback when it didn't either. This is the boy, said Aslan, looking not at Diggory, but his counselors. This is the boy who did it. Oh dear, thought Diggory, what have I done now? Son of Adam, said the lion, this is the evil witch abroad. There is an evil witch abroad in my new land of Narnia. Tell these good beasts how she came here. A dozen different things that he might say flashed through Diggory's mind, but he had the good sense to say nothing except for the exact truth. I brought her here, Aslan, he answered in a low voice. For what purpose? I wanted to get her out of my own world and back into her own. I thought I was taking her back to her place. How came, come, how came she to be in your world, son of Adam? By magic. The lion said nothing, and Diggory uh, knew that he had not told them enough. It was my uncle, Aslan. He sent us out of our own world by magic rings. At least I had to go because he sent Polly first. And then we met the witch in a place called Charn, and she held on to us when... You met the witch? said Aslan in a low voice, which had the threat of a growl in it. She woke up, said Diggory wretchedly, and then, turning very weak, I mean, I woke her up because I, I wanted to know what would happen if I struck a bell. Polly didn't want to know. It, it wasn't her fault. I, I fought her. I know I shouldn't have. I think I was a bit enchanted by the writing under the bell. Do you? asked Aslan, still speaking very low and deep. No, said Diggory. I see now I wasn't. I was only pretending. There was a long pause, and Diggory was thinking all the time. I spoiled everything. There's no chance of getting anything for my mother now. When the lion spoke again, it was not to Diggory. You see, friends, he said, that before the new clean world I gave you is seven hours old, a force of evil has already entered it, waked and brought hither by the son of Adam. The beasts, even Strawberry, all turned their eyes on Diggory until he felt that he wished the ground would swallow him up. But do not be cast down, said Aslan, speaking to the beasts. Evil will come of that evil, but it is still a long way off. I will see to it that the worst falls upon itself, myself. In the meantime, let us talk um, such, let us take such order that many hundreds of years Yet there shall be a merry land and a merry world. And as Adam's race has done the harm, Adam's race shall help to heal it. Draw near, you other two. The last words were spoken to Polly and Cabby, who had now arrived. Polly, all eyes and mouth, was staring at Aslan and holding the Cabby's hand rather tightly. The Cabby gave one glance at the lion and took off his bowler hat. None had yet seen him without it. When it was off, he looked younger and nicer. Uh, and more like a countryman and less like a London cabin. Son, said Aslan to the cabbie, I have known you long. Do you know me? Well, no, sir, said the cabbie, leastways not in an ordinary manner of speaking. Yet I feel somehow, if I may make myself free, that we have met before. It is well, said the lion. You know better than you think you know, and you shall live to know me better yet. How does this land please you? It's a fair treat, sir said the cabby. Would you like to live here always? Well, sir, I'm a married man, said the cabby. If my wife was here, neither of us would ever want to go back to London, I reckon. We're both country folk, really. Aslan threw up his shaggy head, opened his mouth, and uttered a long, single note. Not very loud, but full of power. Polly's heart jumped in her body when she heard it. She felt sure it was a call, and that anyone who'd heard it would obey. Uh, however many worlds and ages they lay between. And so, though she was filled with wonder, she was not really astonished or shocked when all of a sudden a young woman with a kind, honest face stepped out of nowhere and stood beside her. Polly knew at once that it was the cabbie's wife, fetched out of our own world, not by some tiresome magic rings, but quickly, simply, and sweetly as birds fly to their nest. The young woman had apparently been in the middle of a washing day, for she wore an apron, and her sleeves were rolled up to the elbow, and their soap suds on her hands. If she had time to put on her good cold clothes, her best hat 
had an imitation of cherries on it, she would have looked dreadful as it was, but she looked rather nice. Of course she thought she was dreaming. That was why she didn't rush across to her husband and ask him what on earth happened to them both. But when she looked at the lion, she didn't quite feel so sure it was a dream. Yet for some reason, she did not appear to be very frightened. Then she dropped a little half curtsy as some country girls still knew how to do in those days. After that, she went and put her hand in the cabbies and stood there looking round at him shyly. My children, said Aslan, fixing his eyes on both of them, you will be the first king and queen of Narnia. The cabbie opened his mouth in an astonishment and his wife turned very red. You shall rule and name all these creatures and do justice on to them and protect them from their enemies when their enemies arrive. And enemies will arise for there is an evil witch in the world. The cabbie swallowed hard two or three times and then cleared his throat. <clears> throat> Uh, begging your pardon, sir, he said, and thank you very much, I'm sure, which my missus does the same, but I ain't no sort of chap for a job like that. I never had much education, you see. Well, said Aslan, can you use a spade and a plow and raise food from the earth? Yes, sir, I could do that sort of work, being brought up to it. Can you rule these creatures kindly and fairly, remembering they are not slaves like the dumb beasts in your world, but talking beasts and free subjects? I see that, sir, said the cabbie. I tried to uh, do the square thing by them all. And would you bring up your children and grandchildren here to do the same? It'd be me to try, said uh, sir. I'd do my best, wouldn't we, Nellie? And you wouldn't have favorites either among your own children or among the creatures or let any other, uh, let another under or use it hardly? I never could abide by such goings on, sir. And that's the truth. I'd give them what? for if I caught him at it, said the cabbie. Although this was conversation, his voice was growing rather slower and richer, more like the country voice he must have had uh, as a boy, and less like a sharp, quick voice of a Londoner. And if enemies came against the land, for enemies will arrive, and there was a war, would you be the first in the charge and the last in the retreat? Well, sir, said the cabbie very slowly, a chap don't exactly know until he's been tried. I dare say I might turn out ever such a soft one. Never did no fighting except with my fists. I'd try, that is. I hope I'd try to do my bit. Then, said Aslan, you will have done all that a king should do. Your coronation will be held presently. You and your children and the grandchildren shall be blessed. And some will be kings of Narnia and others will be kings of Archenland which lies yonder over the southern mountains. And you, little daughter, he turned to Polly, are welcome. Have you forgiven the boy for the violence he did to you in the Hall of Images and the desolate place, uh, palace of a uh, cursed charn? Yes, Aslan, we've made it up, said Polly. That is well, said Aslan, for now the boy himself.